Dear ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this FIA webinar on nuclear power and the energy transition. My name is Marco Sidi and I'm a senior researcher uh, at this institute. Um, I'm also leading and coordinating a new project uh, on the global politics of the energy transition. And this is the second in a series of uh, webinars for this project. Uh, let me point out right at the start that, um, so today we will be uh, talking about nuclear power and energy transition. And let me point out that we recently published a briefing paper with my colleague, uh, Christina Silvan, uh, on Russia and Kazakhstan in the global nuclear sector from uranium mining to energy diplomacy. And you can download the paper from, uh, from the uh, website. Um, I will briefly introduce today's topic and the key questions that our uh, excellent speakers that agreed to uh, 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 speak today uh, will address. So we, views on nuclear power uh, tend to be split in the international arena. According to some leaders and experts, nuclear power can play an important role in the energy uh, transition, in the transition to a low carbon economy. But according to others, nuclear te technology is too expensive, uh, involves, uh, involves unresolved issues, and, uh, for example, the processing and storage of uh, spent nuclear fuel. Uh, and uh, particularly in, in Europe and North America, we have witnessed uh, severe construction delays for uh, new projects. At the same time, political instability and geopolitical rivalry has cast doubts over some issues, such as the security of uranium supplies. Um, now, for example, we remember political developments in Niger over the summer, an important uh, uranium producer. Uh, and from a Western perspective, uh, the Western industry has uh, struggled to remain uh, uh, very competitive internationally, whereas Russia's Rosatom has acquired a large portfolio of international orders. Uh, China, meanwhile, accounts for over, one, for over one third of reactors that are under construction uh, worldwide. So uh, some key questions we'll address today are what are the prospects for nuclear power within the transition to a low carbon economy? How has the geopolitics of civil nuclear power changed in recent years? And why are some countries investing in nuclear power while others are phasing out their plants? What are the political and security risks in the nuclear sector? Okay, uh, let me introduce our distinguished speakers. Um, I will uh, start from uh, Marta Gospodarczyk, uh, who has over 20 years of experience supporting projects related to nuclear energy at the International Atomic Energy Agency and also at the US Department of Energy. She has worked with projects related to uranium mining, nuclear power, infrastructure development, uh, nuclear power operating experience, electricity markets, so extensive uh, uh, experience and expertise. Um, she has been managing the power reactor information system and the country nuclear power profiles in the IAEA's nuclear power engineering section since 2018. Uh, you find further details in our bio, which is uh, uh, available uh, online uh, in the seminar description. Uh, while at the IAEA, she's been responsible for a few uh, IAEA annual publications, including one of the most popular, which is nuclear reactors in the world. Uh, and on this note, I hand over the floor uh, to uh, Marta, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, display my presentation right now. Please confirm that you can see my slides. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marta Gospodarczyk. It is my pleasure to be with you today. And many thanks to the Finnish Institute of International Affairs for the invitation. Um, I will discuss the uh, status and prospects of the global nuclear power using official statistics. Um, so to provide some context for the role and status of nuclear power, um, let's take a brief look at the electricity uh, production trends. Since 1980, um, fossil fuels, especially coal, um, have dominated the electricity uh, production at over 60%. Uh, natural gas has risen from uh, more than 10%. 
um, while coal uh, share dropped slightly after 2010. Um, you can see how uh, oil has experienced the most significant change, uh, decreasing from about 20% um, in 1980 to about 2% in 2022. Um, hydro uh, remains um, the largest contributor of the low carbon electricity, um, accounting for about 16%. Um, although the share has decreased by about 4% points since 1980. Uh, solar and wind, um, as expected, grew from under 1% to about 12% um, in 2022. And while nuclear doubled in share from uh, between 1980s and 1990s, um, it since uh, really declined. Uh, in 2022, nuclear power contributed to about 9.2% of total uh, electricity production, uh, which is also a slight decrease from um, even levels of the 2021. Uh, so where are we now? Um, Currently, uh, there are 437, uh, 437 operational nuclear power reactors uh, with the total net installed power capacity of 391.4 uh, gigawatt electric um, in uh, 31 countries. About 21.2 uh, gigawatts of that capacity um, and 21 reactors are currently in suspended operations, which means that they are not currently producing any electricity or heat. Um, there's hardly any publication um, and paper or presentation on the general subject of nuclear power, uh, which does not start with um, or include statements um, referring to number of reactors, capacity, in operation or under construction or operating performance information. Um, this kind of information is really crucial for understanding this historical and current state of nuclear power development. And it really serves as the foundations for uh, all of our analysis. Um, the IEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, has been collecting this kind of information and data on nuclear power uh, reactors uh, since 2000, um, 1969. And all of the information is um, available in the power reactor information system. Um, so briefly about PRIS, um, it's the world's only official source of information on nuclear power reactors. It is official and authoritative because the information is provided by officially nominated data providers um, from all of the IEA member states. Uh, PRIS is comprehensive at, as it includes the entire history of nuclear power and unique as it contains the largest um, collection of information um, and statistical reports on nuclear power. Um, all of the um, information and data included in, um, in this presentation are actually based on PRIS. So um, the worldwide cumulative um, reactor operating experience amounts to about 19,700 reactor years of experience uh, with a total capacity of 492.9 gigawatt electric and 642 reactors across 90, uh, 35 countries that have ever operated. Um, of these reactors, 204 reactors right now uh, with about total capacity of 99 gigawatt electric are permanently shut down. Um, currently, there are 31 countries with operating nuclear power reactors. The U.S. Uh, remains to be the country with the largest nuclear power fleet and North America um, is dominating as a region. France follows, uh, contributing also to the Western Europe's second biggest uh, fleet in the world. Um, China's rapid nuclear power expansion over the past decade places it, it uh, in the third place. Uh, please note the difference in the capacity between France and China, comparing to the number of reactors providing the capacity. I would really like to highlight uh, the, the number of the reactors um, not the number of the reactors, but rather the capacity is important when we do analysis of the nuclear power um, uh, impact.
Um, so as of today, uh, a total capacity of 60 gigawatts of electric um, with 58 reactors uh, is under construction in 17 countries. The nuclear power capacity under construction has remained largely steady in the recent um, years, uh, especially the last decade, except for continuous growth in Asia. Um, China is the lead with 22 reactors uh, currently under construction, followed by India with eight reactors currently in construction, and uh, Turkey, which is a newcomer and um, to the nuclear power um, programs, and they're constructing currently four reactors. Um, some uh, 3.7 gigawatt electric of new uh, nuclear capacity already connected this year, uh, connected to the grid this year, that includes uh, reactors in Belarus, also a newcomer, um, China, Slovakia, and the United States. Um, as reported to IEA, five reactors started construction this year, four of them uh, in China and one in Egypt. Um, I want to mention that Egypt is also a newcomer, and this is a their second nuclear power reactor under construction. Um, about six gigawatts of nuclear capacity uh, retired this year, and this includes three remaining or the last uh, reactors in Germany. Uh, one in Taiwan, China, and one in Belgium. Uh, please note, we also capture uh, information on um, Japanese reactors or other reactors that are in suspended operations, but um, restart operations. And this year, two reactors in Japan that were in suspended operations since 2011, Fukushima Daiichi instead, and started operations. Um, so um, using the PRIS 2022 nuclear power status poster, I would like to show the nuclear power impact, uh, nuclear electricity generation, but also utilization of the nuclear power for non-electric applications, such as district uh, and industrial heating, uh, desalination and hydrogen production. Uh, in 2022, the world's nuclear power fleet produced over 2,486 terawatt hours of electricity, which um, we estimated avoided about 1.25 gigatons CO2 em emissions. And it's also important to note um, that 47 reactors provided uh, about 1,600 gigawatt um, hours of electrical equivalent of heat to support district heating industrial uh, heating and desalination. There's also pro uh, hydrogen produ uh, production. However, we have not uh, received information from the nuclear operators about the production. Um, nuclear power capacity growth has been steady over the past decade uh, with over 20.3 gigawatt um, electric increase between 20, 20, 2012 and 2022. Uh, 68 reactors with um, 60, almost 68 gigawatt electric nuclear capacity have been connected to the grid during that period. And over 83% of this capacity growth occurred in Asia. Uh, you can see on that graph that that's where um, the growth uh, is really happening. Compared when 2021, the total electricity production from nuclear power um, reactors decreased slightly uh, by about 4%, and nuclear power accounted for um, 9.2 of total electricity production in 2022. Um, uh, this is also a slight decrease from the previous year at 0.6%. Uh, um, so some countries um, have a diverse energy mix that includes a significant contribution um, from renewables, natural gas, or coal. In such cases, while the percentage share of nuclear power might be high, it competes with other energy sources that might be uh, might contribute um, more to the overall electricity production. Um, also, the nuclear capacity in the country plays a, a crucial role. A high percentage share might be achieved with the relatively small nuclear power capacity. Uh, one thing that I would like to point here is that for the third year in a row right now, China produced more electricity than France, 
um, making China the second largest nuclear power producer after the United States. Um, often we discuss the decline in nuclear power capacity following the Fukushima Daiichi incident in 2011. However, it is uh, essential uh, to highlight a parallel narrative of continuous grow, uh, growth in capacity, slow but continuous. Uh, this graph, for example, shows um, um, you know, a visual uh, representation of this trend. Um, as we can see, major capacity losses um, in 2011, 2019, and 2021 um, happened, and they were predominantly a result of permanent reactor shutdowns in Japan, but also in Germany, uh, based on the, the policy to, um, to shut down completely uh, all of the nuclear power reactors in that country. But at the same time, the new capacity uh, was added to the grid. Um, so top five countries that contributed um, to this capacity growth uh, are of course China, uh, with over 53 gigawatt um, of uh, electric uh, capacity, followed by Co uh, Republic of Korea, uh, Russia, UAE, that is uh, a newcomer to the World Nuclear Program, uh, and also Pakistan. Um, so while the graph might seem uh, simple, uh, you know, with these uh, big blocks uh, of colors, it's rather uh, very complex data analysis uh, visualization that compiles thousands of data points um, from PRIS and represents the nuclear power experience since 1970s. That's when uh, IE started collecting not only data on number of reactors capacity, but also uh, pro electricity production. It includes the key performance indicators that are that we use to assess uh, the performance and reliability of the nuclear reactors. Um, for example, the green area represents that um, the time where nuclear power reactors were producing either electricity or heat. They were um, online. Uh, purple indicates the reactors were offline performing plant refueling and maintenance. Orange indicates unplanned outages due to different reasons. Uh, and we have the uh, details of all of the reasons. And the yellow on the top uh, indicates that there, there were also external reasons outside of the nuclear power plant uh, management control to shut down the, the, pl uh, the plants. Um, based on this graph, uh, we can really say that the nuclear power is uh, reliable um, uh, throughout its operating experience. And um, about 66% of total operational reactor uh, capacity um, has been in operation for over 30 years. Over 23% of uh, that uh, capacity has been in service for over 40 years. And uh, about 2% of um, capacity has been operating for over 50 years. Um, this really shows the aging fleet um, and the needs for the uh, new or upgraded nuclear capacity to offset the plant retirements and contribute to sustainability and global energy security and, of course, uh, global change um, objectives. Uh, nuclear power operators, uh, the governments and other stakeholders uh, are investing in long-term operations, um, applications for the um, uh, extensions of the um, operating um, licenses and aging management programs for an increasing number of reactors. However, um, not all of that uh, fleet will be able to continue working um, or providing uh, services as their original license operating uh, license. Uh, but this is very important uh, that uh, we um, that we support the, the fleet that is going to um, extend their long um, operations um, to ensure sustainable operations and a smooth transition to new capacity. Um, IEA recently uh, released a new um, nuclear power projections, uh, nuclear power capacity projections. 
And in both high and low case scenarios, the IEA now sees a quarter more nuclear energy capacity installed by 2050 than it did as recently as in 2020. Um, that really shows how a growing number of countries are considering nuclear power to address the challenges of um, energy security, climate change, and economic development. Um, many countries are extending the lifetime of the existing reactors, um, as I mentioned, embarking on development of nuclear power programs. Um, and I gave some examples of these countries already, uh, including also construction of advanced reactors designs and exploring um, uh, opportunities of uh, small module reactors. And of course, utilization of um, non-electric applications. There are also reactors built just for that uh, purpose, for non-electric applications, mainly for uh, providing heat. Um, we're looking at big changes in electricity capacity in production. By 2030, we could see um, as much as 22% capacity uh, increase and a double by 2050. Uh, in the optimistic high uh, scenario, uh, high key scenario, nuclear power capacity could grow by 24% by 2030 and um, 140 by uh, percent by 2050. In the more conservative low key scenario, it might grow by 9% by 2030 and by 23% by 2050. Um, Electricity production is set to go, uh, go up to uh, with 20% increase by 2030 and 80% increase by 2050. In the high case scenario, nuclear um, electricity production could grow by 40% by 2030 and triple by 2050. Um, in the low case scenario, it might grow by 24% uh, percent by 2030, reaching 53% by 2050. So despite all of the positive outlook based on the, the IEA projections um, for the nuclear energy, we're still dealing with challenges like um, lack of stable policy for nuclear power development and supporting the existing fleet, uh, financing and supply chain, uh, also regulatory and industrial standardization is a challenge. Um, international collaborations like IEA's Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative um, aims to address these issues. Uh, however, more work is needed to create an investment-friendly uh, environment for new uh, nuclear projects. Um, there have been some positive steps in 2022, uh, including the inclusion of nuclear power in the EU's Sustainable Finance Taxonomy, uh, also, other countries around the world are um, introducing some of the taxonomies as well. Um, so also, let's talk about um, the promising opportunities for the nuclear power. Um, in a world committed to decarbonization, uh, achieving net zero emissions and reducing the dependence on fossil fuels, um, nuclear energy now has a really big um, uh, role to play. And um, a lot of countries are uh, realizing the incredible opportunity um, of nuclear power and ability to provide a stable energy supply um, and affordability in the face of uh, also fluctuating costs. Um, and also, you know, the, the recent energy crisis uh, also and the geopolitical conflicts uh, are also contributing to um, more countries looking to the nuclear power for uh, this um, diversity and including nuclear power in their energy markets. Um, also new developments in the um, SMRs uh, and advanced reactor technologies are um, revolutionizing the nuclear industry and promising um, you know, better enhanced safety, efficiency, and uh, um, adaptability. Um, but as I've shown, nuclear power doesn't stop at electricity generation. I really want to highlight this. Um, new advanced reactor technologies provide uh, even more opportunity for um, uh, clean solutions for heating, uh, desalination, hydrogen production, and uh, uh, desalination 
expanding its role uh, in the broader decarbonization effort. And with this, uh, I think I just try to capture uh, very shortly um, the status of the nuclear power and uh, and the challenges and potential. And here I'm just highlighting the uh, two most recent publications from IEA on the nuclear power reactors in the world and operating experience with the nuclear power reactors in the member states. And thank you. Many thanks, Marta, for uh, um, laying out uh, the status of, of the uh, sector from yours, uh, from your and an AEA uh, perspective. Uh, let me now turn to um, Jessica Jewell, who is an associate professor in energy transitions at the Department of Space, Earth and Environment at Chalmers University and at the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation at the University of Bergen. Um, her research focuses on the feasibility of climate action and quantifying the dynamics and mechanisms of energy transitions using a variety of disciplinary approaches and methods. Uh, also, she's a recipient of a European Research Council starting grant and a leader of work packages in collaborative research projects supported by European and uh, Swedish funding agencies. So, um, I believe you also have a, a presentation. Um, what is uh, uh, the role of nuclear in the energy transition, in your opinion, and what are the main issues in, um, broadly speaking, security uh, terms? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Just say something, because I can't see you. <laughs> yes, yes, we can now. Can you see the right slides, or you see the, you see the full um, slides in the full screen? Yes, I see the full screen. Fantastic. OK, so today I'm going to talk about nuclear power, past and future, and I'm going to pick up on many of the same themes that Marta alluded to, supply chains and the role nuclear may play in um, climate change mitigation. And I work in a, I run a group and our basic question is, what can the history teach us about our future transitions and the feasibility of reaching net zero targets or reaching climate targets? And I've always been fascinated by nuclear because it grew very fast. So nuclear power at its fastest growth rate grew about 3% of electricity a year compared to solar and wind, which grew at about 1.5%. And this is in Europe. But if we look in Europe about at what needs to happen to reach net zero targets, low carbon technologies need to grow even faster. And counterintuitively, in the face of this um, more rapid growth of low carbon electricity technologies, nuclear actually declines. So I'm gonna address two questions today. One is, do we actually need nuclear power for climate? And if so, where? And second, if so, what are the barriers? And here I'm gonna um, highlight the barrier and the dynamics of supply chains, which really shape the development of nuclear power. And let me start with the first question of, do we need nuclear power? And my co-authors and I were interested in this. So we systematic we started by systematically measuring the maximum growth rates of both wind, nuclear, and solar power in every large country and globally. So this covers these measurements cover about 95% of our electricity system. And what we see is that when we do this systematic measurement globally, we see that nuclear power systematically grows faster than both wind and solar power. It has historically. Now, this is not something necessarily a characteristic of nuclear power, so it may not be because of the technology, but it may instead be the context in which it grew. So nuclear power really expanded during the oil crisis and at a time when states were really, really concerned about energy security crises. In contrast, wind and solar power have grown in relatively energy secure environments and under low energy demand. So to compare like for like, we look not only at how um, these technologies have grown historically, but also what Europe is planning for wind and solar power in the face of this energy security crisis that we face today. And what we see is that the commission plans for both um, a rapid acceleration in both wind and solar power, almost to the level that nuclear grew at historically. So we see this really interesting di dynamic and this interaction between the context and the political motivation and commitment and the technologies. 
Now, coming back to my question, do we need nuclear power? And I'm gonna answer this, um, I'm gonna explore this question for Asia. And what we're looking at is IPCC scen ca um, scenarios categorized by their temperature outcome. And this is on the uh, left hand side in the warm colors, we have the warmer scenarios that reach above uh, three degrees. And then on the right hand side, we have the cooler colors with the blue that stabilize temperature at one and a half degrees. And this is the low carbon, the growth of low carbon sources in these scenarios. And what I'm showing you is that if Asia is able to accelerate um, solar and wind to the level to the rate to the growth rate that Europe plans we would still not even reach a one and a half degree target without any nuclear power growth if Asia can accelerate to this really rapid rate which we haven't observed yet but which is in Europeans plans then we could reach a one and a half degree target if China's plans are realized and extended to all of Asia if we take a slightly more realistic um, benchmark for solar and wind. So this is what we call Q3 of national rates. This is faster than 75% of our observations. So 75% of countries at their maximum growth rate of solar and wind actually grew slower than this. So this is a pr still a pretty ambitious rate. And we only get into a, firmly into a two degree world if China implements its plans for expansion and it, those plans extend to all of Asia. So it looks like nuclear plays a really important role, particularly in Asia, in meeting these climate targets. And if that's the case, then we need to understand the dynamics, the historical development of nuclear power. And one of the main barriers of nuclear power development is um, suppliers, so is the supply chain. Because when a country decides to embark on a nuclear power program, they don't start from developing the technology from scratch. They initially generally gain it from get it from a supplier and we see two dynamics in this picture one is really not surprising technologies typically diffuse from a tech what's called the technological core to the technological periphery and we see that picture really clearly in this picture but we see something else and that is this really unusual cold war legacy where we don't have one technological core we have two where the majority of countries which introduce nuclear power either got the technology from the US or the Soviet Union. Now, since the 1990s, of course, the Cold War ended, energy security has improved, and electricity demand has mostly stagnated in the West. There were also a, a couple of um, high profile nuclear accidents, which really shaped the perception of the technology, and Western electricity markets have liberalized. Now, since then, where have countries gotten their nuclear, their first nuclear reactor? Since this change, the majority of countries have gotten their first nuclear reactor from Russia and others from other non-Western, so China and South Korea. So we see this real dominance of Russia in um, nuclear in the first reactor supply. So this is um, Putin with um, Lukashenko of Belarus and also Putin and Erdogan celebrating the start of construction of the first nuclear power plant in Turkey. But we were curious as to how systematic this is. Is it just a question of the first reactor or does it permeate the entire nuclear supply chain? So several years ago, I wrote an article with several co-authors and we asked this question, we answered this question by systematically investigating all nuclear um, bilateral agreements and doing a network analysis to see, okay, is Russia still dominant when we look at this broader array of tangible cooperation? So cooperation over nuclear power plants, but also over fuel supply, waste processing and training. And we found that Russia dominates all of this tangible type of cooperation in over 50% of cooperation agreements. The second thing we saw when we did this analysis was that the US continues to be a major player, but not in tangible cooperation, not in cooperation over nuclear power plants, but in more supportive cooperation. And I wanna use the last few minutes of my talk to turn to some new trends. Um, 
And the first new trend is an increasing interest in nuclear power. And don't pay attention to the US flag at the moment, <laughs> just pay attention to what's under construction. This is the same um, data set that Marta um, presented. And what this shows is that there's really huge interest in emerging economies. So there's this growth of nuclear power in China, India, uh, we see um, planned growth in Egypt and Bangladesh. And if I were giving this talk a year and a half or two years ago, this is what I would say, that there's increasing interest in emerging economies. But today, since since the war in Ukraine started and since climate has come even higher on the agenda, we see new developments. So there's developments, including in Western countries. So the US Inflation Reduction Act actually um, uh, includes specific support for nuclear. And we also see new nuclear planned in several European countries and Canada. Now, the second new trend is a series of geopolitical shifts. And the first is a, the war in Ukraine. And this is starting to make nuclear power more attractive in Europe as an alternative to Russian gas and often pursued with non-Russian suppliers. So this is um, between the US's West, this is a picture of an, um, a, meet, a cooperation meeting between the US's Westinghouse and Poland. So we see that Western countries are really starting to turn to Western suppliers in the face of this crisis. Russia still is attractive for its main clients, but sanctions have made it more difficult. So there was the case of um, the Bangladeshi plans where the original contract was denominated in dollars, and this was um, planned before the war. And then once the war broke out, Russia can't take dollars, so they wanted Bangladesh to pay in um, rubles, and they finally compromised on yuan. And that's the second geopolitical shift, speaking of yuan, is the rise of China. And it really could become a major supplier. We really see increased activity of China uh, signing um, memorandum of understanding with um, potential client states. This could be supported by the major expansion of China's domestic market and its expansionist policy in Asia. And this really aligns with the need to expand nuclear in Asia for climate targets. Now, these two developments lead to two dynamics. One is we could see the emergence of a bipolar world of nuclear suppliers again, with Europe and the US relying on Western reactors and emerging economies relying on Russian and Chinese reactors. We could also see an increase, an interesting competition between Russia and China and the West where Russia and China on the one hand can offer different and more attractive packages to client states because they're supported by the state, whereas Western companies typically cannot offer the full financial support. And then the third new trend, Marta alluded to this, is the possible emergence of small modular reactors or SMRs. So these are reactors which are two to five times smaller than conventional. There are three under construction, three in operation, according to IEA data, and then many more in different design phases. Now, it's very difficult to say anything definite about SMRs because they are such an immature technology. And when technologies are immature, it's very difficult to provide any even medium term projections. We do see that there could potentially be an increasing diversity of suppliers on, with SMRs. However, it's still difficult to say anything um, definite about this. So to come to my conclusions, suppliers can be a major barrier in the rapid expansion of nuclear power. And during the Cold War, nuclear po power diffused from two cores, the US and the USSR. And recently, Russia has dominated nuclear supply chains. But future nuclear supply chains are likely to be more diversified. This is partly from China increasing its interests, but also from increasing interest of client states to buy from Western suppliers. We also see technological developments which could diversify future supply chains. And finally, we may see the emergence, re-emergence of these two cores of suppliers. So thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica, for this uh, excellent presentation. Um, let me turn uh, immediately to our uh, third contributor today, uh, Dr. Jochen Markert, who works as a senior researcher at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, and he is also a lecturer at, at ETH Zurich. 
Uh, Jochen holds uh, degrees in electrical engineering and energy economics and a PhD in innovation studies. Um, his research uh, focuses on sustainability transitions and the interplay of technological change, actor strategies, policy and institutional uh, change. And Jochen, Especially, you wrote an article in 2020 for Energy Research and so Social Science titled Destined for Decline, examining nuclear energy from a technological innovation systems perspective that I found uh, very interesting. So, uh, in your view, what is the role of the nuclear sector in the, in the energy transition from a technological innovation systems perspective? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco, for the introduction, and thanks for having me. And thanks for uh, Marta and Jessica. You know, there's very hard for me to add anything meaningful to after after such competent introductions to nuclear. And I also have to say, I'm not really an expert on nuclear. Um, we did this one study you mentioned, um, but you know, we usually look into you know also the, the broader range of um, low carbon technologies. But here I give you my share. Um, so first of all, as we have already seen, there are lots of issues around and related to nuclear. So climate, competing technologies, we mentioned uh, renewables, the costs of nuclear, electricity market liberalization, and then of course societal and uh, political contexts in different countries, whether they are in favor of or less supportive uh, with regard to nuclear, then we have the innovation. And, you know, of, obviously we have covered already some ground. And in my talk, I will briefly focus on the industry uh, part or industry base, uh, the industry side of nuclear. But before I do that, you, you asked me to briefly also tell a little bit about the perspective I'm <coughs> excuse me, uh, the perspective we are taking in innovation and transition studies. So, um, first of all, when we talk about transition studies, it's about bigger changes such as the ones currently going on in the energy system, but also in related systems such as transport or buildings, where we see fundamental changes often associated with radical innovations going on and that, you know, things are very different later than they were before. So that is a very specific perspective and I tell you a few words more, but I just want to show you one slide of how such transitions look like here in the electricity sector in Germany. That is a phase of pre-development where you see some stable sources of electricity production and some that are more play more of a niche role and then in a second phase, you see that there is something, you know, stability here on the top, but there is something here happening here at the bottom that is typically what we call the takeoff phase, where innovation comes in. And then, then you know, in, in the recent years, you see pretty much of a mess, right, if you will. And um, the important thing that is happening here is that there is a decline also of existing technologies. This is nuclear, the red one, due to phase-out policies. This is uh, coal. And this is what we call the acceleration phase. So we see a more rapid diffusion of new alternatives, in this case, especially wind and solar, and we see a decline of established technologies. So the takeaway from this is that transitions are nonlinear. So we can have stable states and we have can have states of more term turmoil. And in these states, the you know growth rates, Jessica briefly talked about these, they can hit through the roof. And then of course you get all these cumulative effects that you know then costs go down. We have seen this with solar and wind, which we have seen this with um, batteries for electric vehicles. And then this further propels the transition, right? So we see this, accumulative effects and nonlinear effects happening in systems. So this is the second part of this systems perspective that there are not just, we do not just have to look at technologies, but also at businesses, policies, what does society do with these things? So have a more holistic view on what's going on and how are these sectors are changing. And of course, there are some key challenges for example, established infrastructures, lock-ins, and the politics into existing technologies, and you know also the levers which 
can possibly trigger transitions, such as I already mentioned, radical innovation, or also deliberate decline policies, which we have seen um, implemented for coal, but also for nuclear. So you see that there is typically policy intervention in different stages. People talk about policy sequencing, and they include on the one hand innovation policies to stimulate alternatives, but also decline policies such as bans, phase out or carbon taxes to uh, decrease those um, technologies that are not wanted anymore. So back to nuclear. Um, the paper I show you, um, the, the paper we wrote is already if, if it's a little dated. Um, so we have to keep that in mind and also thanks to the co-authors. Um, so any critical questions, ask them. I will forward them to them, uh, to my co-authors. So we ask ourselves whether nuclear as we know it, so big reactors are in decline. Um, we looked, we looked at this from a global perspective. We analyzed uh, 70 years and we took a lot of dimensions to um, try to get a holistic picture of what's going on in nuclear. And of course, I cannot go through all of these. I will only mention a few, but just to show you again that this perspective includes actors and industries. So if you will, the business side, it includes networks. We have already seen from Jessica that networks play a role here. It includes technology performance and also wider context, political contexts, and of course, competing technologies. And here I will focus on market size, firm entries, and uh, the networks for, of customer supplier relationships in nuclear in the past. So first of all, this is similar to the um, to the slides, uh, to, to the stats Marta showed. Um, you see the market size, and here again, we look at um, firms in nuclear construction. So we do not look at um, nuclear operators, but firms in the business of constructing new nuclear. So we see here, there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of growth in the market here and a first wave of decline then later. And this is the second, the newer wave. And here, this is where our data starts. So the big market and the big rush into nuclear was here. And this is when the innovation system kind of took off. And these are, of course, signs of a less healthy or not very healthy market for those who construct nuclear. And we have seen this stats, I can leave that out. And what we see here is that's pretty much the same picture as I showed before, um, but with the different firms involved in this. And here we also looked at, you know, who had what which firm had which market share, but also, you know, after this collapse in the 1990s, um, when did they exit the market? And we see many of the, you know, early players exiting the markets and then come the Chinese and the Koreans. Um, so they come as new players, but many of the Western players have exited the market. And the only one is the, uh, that is still in business is the French one. Uh, Areva, but that has been now taken over by the state. Um, so we have an industry here um, which was very concentrated and, and is even more concentrated today. So which means that we have only a few suppliers of nuclear power plants that um, you can choose off if you want to build one. Um, that key actors, I already mentioned that, have exited um, the market and that the lead actors have changed from Western to Eastern uh, suppliers. And what we also did in the study is that we looked at the uh, innovation networks. So in the sense of who were the suppliers and who were the, um, the, 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 the um, owner or the operators of nuclear plants. So who ordered them? And they, you can see here in, so it's, Every, every graph is for 10 years. So you see that here in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s, we see quite, you know, quite intense networks um, of collaboration between different uh, reactor suppliers and uh, uh, different um, utility companies as, as um, 
nuclear power operators. And then starting from the 90s into the 2000s, um, these networks have very much thinned out. And this is, again, you know, a sign of a deteriorating industrial base, right? And this is, um, of course, something that is not looking at the moment very supportive for the future of nuclear. So to sum up, um, I have only looked into the industrial side, but when we took this study, many indicators pointed to a decline of nuclear and especially a weakened industry base. And of course, and both Marta and Jessica have mentioned this, um, there were also positive developments. So it's not just uh, black or white, um, it's a bit of both. Um, so of obviously the new constructions, and especially in China, the hopes for SMRs, the demand growth in many places, but also, and that is something I'd see as, as probably one of the main challenges today is the rapid decline in competing technologies, especially solar and wind, but also storage, um, you know, especially batteries, um, that these will re represent one of the major challenges for nuclear, that those competing technologies, their costs decline rapidly and again in a nonlinear way. And so there is a big challenge from these competing technologies and also, of course, in liberalized markets, which many in Western countries are, um, new nuclear is very unlikely without state aid. We see that in uh, France and we see that also in the UK that you know, you can today only build new nuclear if you have long-term um, purchase contracts. Okay, that was my take on it. Thanks a lot and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, many thanks, Jochen. And uh, on your last point, by the way, this is a very interesting question because uh, the paradigm that dominated Western energy markets, uh, so liberalization, is now somewhat temporarily challenged and we have seen that this also affects nuclear in a way because it was included, for instance, in the uh, green taxonomy of the EU. So this is a big question, maybe in the last couple of years, we whether definitely uh, there will be, uh, yeah. to what extent also there will be uh, support for it, because I understand that the support has to be uh, substantial if, if, yeah. if the West wants to compete. But let me ask. So we had some. We had three very uh, uh, well structured, comprehensive presentations. Um, um, now, because of how I structured uh, the webinar, I take responsibility for it. We don't have much time for discussion. Uh, but let me ask a question, a general question uh, to um, to all of you, um, which is maybe at the core of the of the topic we are discussing. Can climate action wait for the timeline of uh, nuclear projects? And uh, if this timeline, of course, I mean, there isn't a single timeline, there's different projects. Uh, and if we are fine with time, is it thanks to Rosatom, China, India? Um, please take the question from whichever angle uh, you prefer. And uh, um, I don't know if anyone would like to start. Um, if if not, we can just proceed in the in the order uh, of the presentations. So I would like to say that um, as I'm collecting data from uh, from all of the member states building these reactors, and um, you know we're looking at the climate change um, challenges, and we try to make sure that. The nuclear power can contribute to, you know, reducing the CO2 emissions. We're we're also looking at the challenges of um, building these new reactors. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's not very easy to um, collect information on the uh, delays in building of the reactors. I mean, China is the dominating uh, player here. We are um, working with them, trying to capture the lessons learned seeing how they are progressing with the building. I mean, they have really ambitious plans, uh, you know, for the future, um, building the, you know, uh, so many reactors um, and in a very short time, but we see already delays even with their uh, projects. So um, 
So I, I think we need to be really patient, um, especially there is a lot of reactors that are being planned, you know, advanced react uh, technologies and SMRs. Uh, these are all very immature technologies. We need to really be patient and uh, utilize other, um, you know, innovative approaches for, you know, climate change uh, challenges. So, um, but I'm, I'm talking from basically a statistical information, um, working very closely with member states, with with China, with uh, uh, with Russia, with all of the other uh, stakeholders that are, you know, building new reactors. Uh, that we really need to be patient, but this this we need to really also focus on the nuclear and let you know um, encourage, uh, especially the financing part, you know investors to, uh, and also states uh, to support these projects. Thank you, Marco. Can I go? Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Super interesting and super interesting to listen to you all. Um, so, I mean, there are two parts of your questions. The first is timeline for climate action. And when I hear that question, I always think timeline compared to what? And with timeline, there are two aspects. There's how fast you can get to take off and then how, like, how fast you can build out um, a new technology. So it's like, if you're driving to the supermarket, it's how fast how long it takes you to get to the highway and then what's the speed limit on the highway so far we've seen that the speed limit on the highway for solar and wind has been lower than for nuclear that doesn't mean that that is going to continue to be the case um i mean i think but that that's what we've seen so far and i mean this is when you measure it once you're once you've reached your maximum cruising speed of these technologies not when you're still in this acceleration stage um, there is a question of lead times um, and, you know, project delays, which Marta was referring to. To me, these, this is not purely a technological question. It's also a political question. So I did some work on LNG a few years ago. And, um, you know, basically everybody in the industry was telling us it takes 10 years to build an LNG terminal. You can't do it faster. Just forget it, forget it, forget it. And then suddenly there was war in Europe and, you know, bam, we had like LNG terminals built in uh, one or two years. So I think some of this lead times can and also how fast you go on the highway can be affected by the politics of it. I think one thing that um, really, really impedes nuclear power, particularly in the West, I think came out in uh, Joachim's presentation of this reduced industrial base in the West, because I think in this political climate of you know, facing energy security concerns, Western countries aren't going to be interested in building out their nuclear power fleets with purely Russian and Chinese technologies and reshoring an industry base and rebuilding an industry base. Well, then you're talking about a whole nother process, not just about getting the technology, but kind of about restarting the industrial process of nuclear within Europe and within the West. Yeah. I can only I can only add to this, you know, usually I would say it's 10 years for getting a license in the West and another at least 10 years for for construction. So we are talking about roughly 20 years. And of course, you can you can work on these speeds and I fully agree you can do politically a lot to accelerate these processes. But still, even if we were assuming that there are super favorable policies for nuclear and everybody wanted to get a new new reactor, um, like in two years or something, we don't have the engineers, we don't have the firms, we don't have the investors. So for from a business perspective, it's in many places of the world pretty much a dead technology or a non-interesting technology. And of course, if you see the investments that are made in renewables, that the investments that are made in hydrogen, in new batteries, they are massive and this is where you know the the capital capital also the you know the new students everybody wants to go to and it's very difficult to excite you know at the moment maybe smrs will change the game in 10 years or 20 but it is very uncertain right so at the moment the game and the money and the excitement is in these alternative low carbon technologies and if you tell somebody about nuclear you're like yeah you know, anyway, that's that's a challenge. Just a quick follow up again to whoever wants to uh, um, answer on this. 
Um, but what about, for example, Turkey, Egypt? As you pointed out, they also have projects in the uh, in the nuclear sector. Uh, so is it about willingness to take technology from, uh, especially Russia in this case? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can speak to that. Um, yeah, so I mean, if you take, if, you know, a country is willing to take um, technology from Russia or China, particularly Russia has these really um, slick, uh, attractive packages for client states where they help with the financing, they help with the training, they do the training for you, they give you, they basically do the whole thing. You're buying a whole nuclear technological system. You're not just buying a reactor. And that's just a completely different um, project than developing it from scratch. Um, and that changes both how long it takes you to get on the highway, so both the time to take off and also how fast you can build it. Because if you have the whole, um, if you, you basically kind of import the whole sector, you don't just import the power plant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, Unless uh, uh, Marta and uh, mm. Jochen have final remarks, I can only uh, recommend to uh, uh, to our audience to read uh, the publication the publications of our speakers today. Uh, we had three uh, excellent uh, speakers. Um, it's a very uh, big and complex topic, so we we hope we provide it. A very brief uh, introduction um, on this. Um, so I would like to thank the speakers for taking the time to participate in this uh, webinar and the audience uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, and I hope you will join us at our next project events. We will move to discussions on the energy transition uh, in uh, uh, China and India next, where, by the way, nuclear will also be one of the topics we, we address. Uh, Many thanks uh, once again and uh, have a nice afternoon and evening.